So, uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for attending this very important event. Dear Under Secretary uh, Tripodi, uh, dear Director Bath, Governor uh, O'Malley, thank you very much for attending. Uh, my friend Marco uh, Marazzitti, distinguished guests. Welcome to the Embassy tonight. It's such a pleasure for me to host this event tonight together with the Comunità di Sant'Egidio. Comunità di Sant'Egidio does not need an introduction, but certainly it's such a renowned community that plays a crucial role worldwide. When we first met, uh, it was a month ago, and we had the idea of hosting at, at this event as a sort of kickoff in view of tomorrow's conference. Uh, I'm very pleased that uh, this event might eventually take place uh, in view of uh, tomorrow's conference hosted by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. By uh, operating in more than 70 uh, countries in the world, the Comunità di Sant'Egidio helps whoever is in need, from homeless to migrants, from children to elderly people, and works to support both peace and justice. It is also a great pleasure to welcome uh, here tonight distinguished speakers and guests from all over the world. This qualified audience shows how much the topic we will be covering today and the days to come, the abolition of death penalty, arises interest worldwide. The title of tonight's event, No Justice Without Life, is a message of hope. Punishment, even the most severe, must never result in the deprivation of life. The abolition of death penalty is a top priority for Italy. A battle that my country has been consistently leading for years, being at the forefront of the struggle to end penalty worldwide. This is such a strong national consensus that goes beyond any political allegiance, is really uh, uniting across the aisle the Italian parliament, and this has been a common feature over the years. This is why Italy has proposed and sponsored the UN resolution calling on a universal moratorium on the death penalty. And thanks to the support of many religion, faith, secular and civil associations and organizations, like the ones here represented tonight, the United Nations General Assembly passed on December 18, 2007, such an important uh, resolution. Since then, we have been standing firm on its support by applying all diplomatic means at our disposal. This long-standing policy is driven by our belief that death penalty undermines human dignity, is no deterrent, and that any mistake is reversible. Since 2007, there has been a growing international momentum towards the evolution of this practice. Over the years, the revolution has gained more and more support and is now backed by more than 120 states worldwide. The UN General Assembly will reaffirm its commitment at the end of the current year, hopefully showing that the trend towards the abolition of death penalty is irreversible. But let me just spend a few moments to speak about justice at large and respect for a rules-based international order. If there is something, in fact, that the recent history has shown us is that justice and peace cannot be taken for granted. If there can be no justice without life, it is also true that can, there can be no peace without justice. This year marked the return of war in Europe. The Russian aggression against Ukraine brought back the horror of war to the heart of Europe and is now spreading destabilizing consequences far beyond our continent. For the sake of preserving peace, Italy and the whole European Union, like many other countries in the world, we are working hard and closely, relying on the principle enshrined in our charter, the Charter 
our United Nations. As your work shows, as the effort of all the organizations represented here tonight, and who will, the ones that will be present tomorrow, and the activist teaches us is that one needs to fight for justice as well as for peace. It should be the object of continuous work and effort. And this is why I thank you so much for the work you are doing every day, not just at the time of a single conference, to make our war a better one. And now it will be my pleasure to give the official kickoff to the event and allow the many senior panelists to take the floor. Thank you very much. Now I invite Helga Barth, Director for Human Rights, Global Health and International Development of the German Federal Foreign Office to take the floor. Um, Madam Undersecretary, um, Your Excellency, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a, un, it's an honor. It's it's okay. It's an it's an honor to have been in, in, in invited uh, to address this this audience. And uh, I first of all, I'd like to give the regards of State Secretary Baumann, um, who was invited by the by the uh, Italian ambassador and unfortunately couldn't be with you tonight. So I'm a mere substitute. Um, uh, what, what brings us together tonight is our joint advocacy against the, uh, capital punishment um, and our cooperation with civil society. As diplomats, humble diplomats, we can promote the abolition in other countries. However, in the end, abolition of the death penalty is a domestic process, very often a rather complicated one, and it has to be driven locally. And usually it's driven by civil society and especially by so dedicated organizations like the Comunità di Sant'Egidio. Um, it is driven by activists who advocate against the death penalty, by lawyers who represent death row inmates in court, by journalists and by artists who make the death penalty visible, and of course by you. This is why Germany supports civil society organizations in their fight against the death penalty. And this is also why we are the proud hosts uh, of this year's uh, World Congress against the death penalty that is going to um, commence tomorrow morning um, with a speech by Minister Baerbock. Abolition of the death penalty is not just, uh, not just a conference and not just a, a congress, although uh, one visited by, by, by um, many people, it is a process. Um, three brief points. Um, I think we all have to acknowledge the relevance of different country contexts. Advocating for abolition in the United States is different from advocating for abolition in Belarus, Zimbabwe, or China. In particular, we have to come up with innovative ways on how to work towards abolition in countries in which the death penalty is used as a terrible tool for political repression with very limited civil society space. And you know which countries um, I'm not mentioning here. Second. We believe that we have to focus on forging alliances between more progressive and more conservative parties. Many political leaders in non-abolitionist countries are personally in favor of abolish, uh, abolishing the death penalty, but they fear that populists may take advantage. Building cross-party alliances can reduce political costs and civil society can play a very important role in this. Sant'Egidio has done this many, time, many times by bringing together different parties and by working with more conservative actors in particular, but also with others, building bridges. And this is related to my third point. In many countries, 
significant parts of the population are actually in favor of the death penalty. This is something we have to address and everybody working on the issue is addressing and well aware of it. Uh, I, do, I do not have German polls on the death penalty, but um, I do recall one when the death penalty was um, amazingly popular in, in Germany several years ago. I believe that no one who has witnessed an execution endorses capital punishment, no matter what the crime has been. I'm sure that every one of you have heard and is following the situation in, in Iran. I would like to finish my address by reiterating Friday's call of several UN Special Rapporteurs. Iran, stop sentencing peaceful protesters uh, to the death penalty. Thank you very much. Now, uh, before giving the floor to Mr. Mario Marazziti of La Comunità di Sant'Egidio, the co-organizator and co-sponsor of tonight's event, I will invite you to look at a short video. Thank you. Colosseum. Here we are again, together, spaced apart but united. Once again, we want to enlighten you, to light up a dream started together many years ago. Now we seem to see better. On the one hand, the many victories for our cause because new countries have decided to abolish or suspend the death penalty and say yes to life. On the other hand, in this period, we have seen many, too many people die. Humanity must change. It's urgent. No one can delude himself into staying sane in a sick and unjust world. The pandemic has taught us we have to choose life or death. Our battle for life is a fight against injustice, which is like toxic air, a cloud that takes your breath away and ends up affecting and polluting everyone's life. Precisely from this place so beautiful and sumptuous, but which has seen so much evil, and where men have killed other men as if it were a spectacle or a game. From this point, we want to reiterate that every murder changes the world for the worse, and that the death punishment affects everyone and dehumanizes everyone. It lowers everyone to the level of those who kill and turns the state into a cold-blooded murderer. Even in the name of the citizens who do not desire this, it transforms men. It makes human beings into beasts. The death penalty is like the war of an entire state against an individual. The world is tired of wars, of ethnic clashes, it is tired of mourning the victims of the pandemic. How to do it then? What can we do? We have to look up. We have to look at the sky. This year, we want to dedicate a thought to the many friends who are no longer with us and who have accompanied our journey towards the abolition of the death penalty, like a luminous trail. Friends who have fought and taught us a lot, like Dominique Green like Dimitri and Tamara Chikonova, like Bill Pelke, and many with them have become bright stars, while the darkness of capital punishment around the world has diminished. This is why tonight, here, and in thousands of cities around the world, we discover a simple truth, that there is never true justice without life, that violence and death are combated only with life. We want more life. It is possible. With your commitment, with Cities for Life, a life made to measure for everyone, without fear, that we should regain strength in the world. With you, together, the future has already begun.
I am very happy uh, that we all together went in front of the Colosseum that is our friend in this struggle for life. And uh, I want, let me say thank you to the many that have made this meeting possible. But uh, for sure, uh, all the staff of the Italian Embassy, that poor staff has been put under a pressure to make this event possible. But you, you who are here, are the evidence that it is real, that we want to kick off, to give the testimony to the World Congress that tomorrow is going to start. And uh, the future has already begun. I think that, uh, let's try to understand what we are speaking about. In uh, 1976, in the world, out of 200 countries, only 16 were the states that abolished in the world the death penalty. So the words that you, uh, uh, Director General uh, Bart, what you, Ambassador Varicchio, said, uh, is completely true. Uh, what uh, your states, our governments, what our European countries are doing, I think also of France, uh, is amazing. And what uh, happened over these last years, we never had a pope that was saying that the death penalty is always unacceptable because it undermines, it is an attack to the inviolability and uh, the dignity of every human being, of every person. So we are now in a good company. Now, 144 countries are not using the death penalty anymore in this moment in the world, by law or in practice. And uh, in 2019, 20 have been the states that have used the death penalty in re for real. And uh, over the last five years, the executions in the world that were registered, let's put out of the number uh, Vietnam, North Korea, and China, because we do not have precise figures. But the figures that we know over the last five years, the number of executions decreased from on average of 1,500 per year to 600, 700 maximum, 500 per year. And uh, this year, 637 executions have been registered till last September. There are too many, but it is a big success. And uh, we still have uh, Iran, Saudi Arabia that lead the run towards executions, more than 400 in Iran this year, and more than 100 in Saudi Arabia, then Syria, Egypt, United States, but only 10. It is the lowest number over the last 20 years. Even one is too much, but the world is changing. We are the, the first generation that is really watching this change in the history of the world. So this, is, this became possible over the last 20 years, 25 years, because many things happened. You that are here are part of this change. Uh, for instance, uh, the World Coalition did not exist. In 2002, May 13th was born. The initiative, the, the dream was an ACPM, French organization, dream. But then the World Congress decided that wanted it started. Then in May, the first organization came to Rome and 13 organizations made the World Coalition start. For the first time, we have uh, five pictures that are in the corridor. At the end, when we go, go somewhere else after this meeting, 
we can watch these first and only pictures of that birth of the World Coalition. Uh, and uh, then the First World Congress in Strasbourg. And we have here Raphael Schoenwil from CPM. So I will give him the floor for a few minutes for just to tell us that tomorrow is starting a new big step towards abolition. And then I want to just remind to each of us that last week uh, the Soto Secretaria uh, gave us uh, first the big news about last week at the UNGA in uh, New York and uh, 127 countries voted in favor of the moratorium. I remember when for the first time it was approved after 15 years of attempts and Italy had started the first attempt. The second one was by European Union, but then so as to prevent those who were saying that it was a, a neo-colonialistic vision of the human, human rights, then the real resolution that was at the end approved was the one that was supported by sponsors in each continent. And then, but at that time, it was 98 at the beginning, and then 103 votes. Now we have 24 countries in addition to that that approve a resolution for a global moratorium in the world. It is not an obligation, it is not mandatory, but it is a new standard of human rights. And now it is a shame for a country or for, or for a state to be on that bad part of history that keeps the death penalty. Because of that, it's not, ju not just a cultural change, it is the world is changing, like torture, like about torture, like about uh, slavery, even the death penalty will become soon something uh, that goes into the past. Of course, even today there is torture, but unfortunately not by law. It is forbidden, it is wrong. So those who do it are bad guys. Okay, now this is just to say that we are very happy to have this event. And so I want to give the floor to Raphael so, give, so we have just the, uh, just the testimony. You invite us tomorrow to the World Congress, just that. And then I want to give the floor to some testimonies that uh, will tell us how they obtained that the death penalty could uh, stop in their own state, in their own countries, and to many others. Thank you. Raphael, please. Grazie mille, grazie mille Mario. Um, let me express first my, my pleasure to be here and the honor. The honor first to be here with such distinguished guests. And first of all, I would like to mention uh, President El Gogot from Mongolia and Governor Robert O'Malley. I would like to uh, mention all the important political representatives. Um, Christian Tobira is in the room as well. It's such important because abolition comes from political willingness. It comes from one day when a man, a woman in a position of power decide that abolition has to come. And I really would like to thank you for that for your commitment in the past, in your state, in Mongolia, and nowadays with ICDP, and it's important. It's an honor to be here with such distinguished guests, but it's a pleasure because you are not only guests, you are friends. And I would like to remind, and uh, being there with Mario, Always, always remind me when I'm coming in Rome, in Trastevere, in El Café degli Amici, con un gran vaso di vino. Uh, I would say that we are the Amici contra la pena di morte, the friends against the death penalty. We are all here 
together because we fight for only for the same values. The right to life, the abolition of the death penalty worldwide. And as you mentioned, Mario, and I will not be, be, lo be long, but the, um, when you are talking, when we, we are mentioning Italy on the fight against death penalty, of course, we rely Italy diplomacy and Italian civil society to the moratorium resolution. And I really would like to thank La Comunità di Settentrio, Hands of Cain, Notoki Kaino, and all the Italian civil society for their work, incredible work, on the fight against death penalty and especially on the resolution, the moratorium resolution. Um, in the coming days, you will have the next World Congress against death penalty under the co-sponsorship of Germany, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of the European Union, France and Switzerland and many other partners. But we will certainly have discussions because we have to build in the next four days the future of the coalition. And here, with the presence of the World Coalition members, all we are, we are going to build the next three years and I'm pretty sure to build a better world. So the Congress is beginning tomorrow and will take place over the next days. Please, you, are, you can download the smartphone app. You will have all the program in the application, the smartphone application. And um, I count on you for the next four days at the World Congress Against Death Penalty. Thank you very much. Grazie mille. Grazie, grazie Rafael. Uh, thank you, Rafael. Uh, Rafael reminds us that here, uh, people who fight against the death penalty at an institutional level, at a grassroots level, at the end of the day, become friends. Because uh, I think it is part of becoming more and more humane being at the side of those who are at risk of being their life taken away. But, but that said, uh, I think that uh, I want to give the floor to uh, an organization and to two special people. Uh, some years ago, uh, the International Commission Against the Death Penalty, uh, Rajiv, can you show that you are at all, please. Uh, Rajiv Narayan. <laughs> Rajiv Narayan is uh, uh, present us our two few, uh, next guests, please. Uh, tell us uh, who they are. Uh, President Albert Gorge. Um, well, the International Commission Against Death Penalty, we started in uh, 12 years ago. And we have uh, 24 commissioners, including President Elbeck Dodge, who as president abolished the death penalty uh, in 2017. Uh, I won't tell the rest of the story. In Mongolia. Mongolia. And uh, he used a very... Yes. Mongolia is a small country, just uh, 10 times Italy. Yes. <laughs> I was going to say President Elbeck Dodge would disagree about the size. <laughs> and uh, the other commissioner is uh, uh, Governor Martin O'Malley, who abolished the death penalty in the state of Maryland in 2013. And uh, our, our commissioner is led by President uh, Navi Pillai, uh, the former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And we are supported by uh, 23 member states, including Italy. Thank you. The Italian ambassador, the Italian commissioner is Giuliano Amato. So, President Albert Gorge, please give us uh, your testing. Thank you very much. Good evening. In 2009, June 18th, I actually took oath as president of Mongolia. 
And after that, I entered into my room. And on my desk, I saw two papers and face down. And I asked, what, what are they? And they said, one is order to execute, one is order to commute. And we need your signature. And I choose to commute. I choose life. It was not one day. Of course, it was my first day as a president. I chose life. And during that time, Amnesty International report I read that Mongolia was identified equally in terms of the secrecy, in terms of the brutality of carrying out that penalty, they equal to North Korea. That was really difficult experience. You know, Mongolia was second communist country after Russia. And that uh, Russian, that Stalinist type of execution system actually kept up to the 2009 for very long time. And if uh, some person gets the death penalty from that first day, that person's destiny never known. And even after execution, that person is buried in an unnamed buried place. And even the name, headstone, name is fake. And his family, his loved ones never know what happened to that guy. That was so brutal. And from that, abolishing death penalty it actually took for me for eight years in Mongolia, we have two terms. Uh, uh, pre yeah, president, you, you have to serve two terms, each is four years. It took for me to stand on that decision, eight years and 13 days. Just before leaving my office, that was, uh, I left my office in July 10th, 2017. Actually, in, in July 1st, 2017, our criminal code came into effect. And I actually got my state, that the state uh, had a death penalty. When I left my office, my state does, yeah, didn't have death penalty. I told that Mongolian history now, written newly, there is new page. In Mongolia, in Mongolian statehood, there were the full of flood, full of revenge. From this day, there will be Mongolian statehood will be without blood, without death penalty. That's the new beginning. And we did, we did that in Mongolia. And after that, of course, we got new president. Usually when, when you have there are politics, yeah, very questionable person came into power and he uh, he demanded the reinstating death penalty. And he asked our justice minister to bring that law amendment into parliament. But during that time, I felt that uh, our society already changed during that eight years. If you put, even though death penalty issue is difficult issue, challenging issue, if you put that into your society in an open discussion, people usually are, and get more wisdom. I really believe that usually life has a much more richer than the death. Life has a much more grace, much more honorable than death. And people usually find more arguments against death when people discuss those very tough issues. And after eight years, during when, when I took that decision, 70% of our public, when, when we had a polling, they were for death penalty. They said, Mr. President, you are making a mistake. After eight years, 60% of our public saying, abolishing death penalty for Mongolia was a good thing. President Elbigdorj did a good thing. 
I think if, if you have that open society, if you have that open discussion, usually prevails those human things, usually prevails life. That's a really honorable thing. Now we know that in the last five years, only 20 countries exercising that penalty. 144 in practice, in law, they are not exercising that penalty. There are 193 member states in U United Nations. Only there are 50 countries now. 20 is exercising, 30 we can work. I think uh, every year if we got at least one country or three country more, and bringing to our camp, camp, uh, life camp, I think uh, we will succeed. We will make our blue pl planet without that penalty. I really believe in our lifetime it, it can be achieved. We, we should achieve that. Uh, from that really starts all those things, justice, you know. After you, when you abolish that penalty, people talk about torture. People talk about uh, uh, just the system, how, how our system is just, how our laws are working, how people are uh, carrying those sentences, life sentences in a, in a prisons. From that actually begins the real justice, if you want. I think that that's very important. And uh, two weeks ago, I was in Malawi. I think we're going to hear from Malawi very good news. And I campaigned for life. It was really nice. I met president and uh, people in power, opposition, ministers, and members of parliament. And when we talked about death penalty, always our argument, always our side, overwhelmingly prevailed. And, uh, and in, in Malawi, we got that. Three years ago, we, I, I was in Zambia. And uh, I, I think from Africa, we're going to get very good news. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> uh, I think that very good news are coming from Africa. Africa is already uh, radically changing on that. And uh, I want to go back to one day that probably Governor O'Malley well remembers May 2nd, 2013. What were you doing on that day, please? I had, I had to check out, you know, I honestly didn't remember that particular date, but I'm guessing since all of you are here, that was the date we repealed the death penalty in Maryland. It took, it's a great honor to be here with all of you and to see the, the ambassador again. And uh, thank you, Your Excellency, for hosting us. Uh, Mr. President, man, you can see why you were president. That was awesome. We're all ready, we're all ready to stand up and sing the closing hymn after that one. Uh, it is a great honor to be here for this, uh, for this gathering. And I was recruited as a commissioner on the International Commission Against the Death Penalty by Bill Richardson someone who would uh, probably be known to many of you. And uh, I, I spoke to Governor Richardson very recently, and uh, I said, uh, Governor, thank you for recruiting me to this work, because it is good work, and it's noble work, and it's really given me a profound sense of, of purpose and meaning. And I think that each of you shares in that, where this issue especially is is concerned. Uh, I bring you uh, also, before I tell that story of how we repealed the death penalty, and I promise I'm going to keep it short, uh, I bring you joyous news from the United States of America. The joyous news is that uh, the midterm elections really went great for the Democratic <laughs> Party. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> uh, I was, it's, we were working on uh, many things in the United States and um, with Rajiv and uh, Sunta and Elena and you know, lots of balls in motion, but boy, the shadow of those midterms loomed large. And we, didn't, we weren't quite sure how it was going to turn out. That's the uh, fun thing about democracy. Uh, and nothing focuses your mind quite like your own democracy. 
And I was coming through uh, Iceland today because Rajiv was trying to save money on the ticket. So I came through Iceland. And uh, when I landed, it was uh, uh, 7 a.m. in Iceland, but it was still only like 2 a.m. Baltimore time, and the bar was open in Iceland. So I order a Gull beer, just kind of keep it rolling. And uh, I didn't have any local currency in my pocket, so I pulled out two American dollars. And I put the American dollars in the woman's tip jar, and I said, I'm sorry, I only have American dollars. She looks at him, she goes, that's good. And I said, and you know what? On, on Tuesday, we voted against Trump again. And she said, that is very good. <laughs> but let me not be partisan. The truth is that in our state of Maryland, we were able to repeal the death penalty, uh, and we were only able to do so because of some Republican votes. Not many, but enough. And I suppose the Holy Spirit, she knew we didn't need more than one or two more. Uh, so uh, here's the short story of how we were able to repeal the death penalty in Maryland. Maryland is south of the Mason-Dixon line. So in the so-called historic Confederacy, the Lincoln, uh, uh, along with a lot of uh, cannons on Federal Hill, managed to keep us in the, in the Union during the Civil War, uh, Maryland does have a Southern culture. Uh, when I was first elected mayor and, uh, governor in 2006, but before I could be sworn in, our Supreme Court struck down our law on the technicality that we had not dotted our I's and crossed our T's properly enough in adopting a three-drug protocol for strapping another human being uh, down to a gurney and, and killing them in our names and in our children's names. So we were left with a decision. Do we put new regulations back in? with T's firmly crossed and I's dotted, or do we put our heads down and uh, repeal something that not only has proven not to be a deterrent, but can never be fairly administered in a human system of justice, has often been disparately uh, administered, and can never ever be flawless. So uh, we decided to go for repeal, even though we did not have the votes, and in our state 55% of people were against repealing the death penalty. Just leave it alone, you have other issues. Even a lot of my own advisors, well intentioned, you didn't run on this, we didn't campaign on it, never came up, just let it be. You don't have to repeal it. So I listened to all of that sage advice and then we went for repeal. Ben Civiletti, uh, former Attorney General of the United States, who was from Maryland, Connie agreed to step up and chair a commission. We had people on both sides of the death penalty. You want to talk about civil society, there were a lot of tears, but there was also a lot of civility as Ben, I hadn't thought about this before, civil Eddie, you know, led that commission. Uh, we didn't vilify people that didn't think as we did on this issue, but we brought people and called them back to, to the table of democracy to ask whether or not this is something we should be doing. Uh, the first time it came for a vote, we lost by two votes. Uh, so a couple of years went by, and we did it again. And we lost again by two votes. And then a couple of years, a couple, and, and during that year, the president, Senate president, who was opposed to me, said, uh, I don't understand why the governor's forcing us to have this, call this vote, because the magic number that we needed was, I think, 20, 23, I think, uh, in the Senate. He said, the governor only has 21 votes. I don't know why he's even calling it. I said, I might only have 21 votes, but the Holy Spirit might find another two, and she's never late. But she didn't show up that time. Two years later, uh, a couple changes happened. Uh, one was that a, uh, uh, one of the Democratic senators told me privately that uh, he had changed his mind. Even though he had voted for the death penalty before, he had changed his mind. We did a lot of lobbying, even had uh, Ellie Wiesel of a blessed memory call him up at the dinner table and try to ask him to change, which ultimately he did. And then we had the replacement of a Republican senator. Uh, the Republican senator who retired early was pro-life in every respect except the death penalty. <laughs> the, the, uh, the new Republican senator whispered to me after I swore him in in a kind of, you know, perfunctory ceremony. I didn't have any discretion over it. He was sent there by members of his own party. And he said, Governor, I just want to let you know that not only am I pro-life, but unlike my predecessor, I'm also pro-life on the death penalty. 
So I just wanted you to know that in case you can find one more vote. So we had the two more votes we needed. The rest, as they say, is history. Uh, some of the, one of the other factors that allowed us to repeal the death penalty, I truly believe, is this. Uh, I served with some really talented men and women uh, who were uh, passionately committed to saving lives. There's a beautiful saying in the Talmud that if you save just one life, it is as if you have saved the world. Certainly that was the ethic that motivated us. And Sister Helen Prejean actually came to Annapolis and helped us in that lobbying effort. But there were actual things we were doing from a policy and administrative standpoint that led us, that allowed us to achieve, not through barometric pressure or a weather event, but allowed us to achieve the biggest reduction in violent crime in 35 years in our state. It was better information sharing, parole, probation, a host of actions and follow through that allowed us to say with credibility to our people, we know what works and we're doing it. And we are saving lives together. But we also know that the death penalty does not work. It is not a deterrent. It is expensive. It is sometimes administered in error and it's time to repeal it. And by the time we did, we had shifted public opinion 55% uh, the other direction in favor of life, in favor of repealing the death penalty and replacing it uh, with life without parole. I leave you finally with uh, these thoughts. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer spoke a lot about grace and he distinguished between cheap grace, which you might say is the rituals, the religiosity, and costly grace. Uh, costly grace is the grace that good people realize is work worth doing on this earth. Thank you very, very much. I, I think that uh, uh, the more we go on in, in our uh, event and meeting, we understand how we are confirmed in the idea that a culture of death, as it is the death penalty, uh, actually uh, takes away from society some energies and some antibodies to violence. So uh, no justice without life. But, uh, and now I will go to the second and last part of our meeting. And uh, so I would uh, ask to the, not to Andre Paluda, that I cannot see Andre Paluda. Uh, I think uh, he could not reach us, probably there is a plane that is late. But Kashturi Pato, Antoinette Shaheen, and Deborah Milky to sit on these three chairs, please. Uh, move uh, and come on these three chairs, the three of you, Deborah and Antoinette and uh, Kashturi. Antoinette uh, is coming probably, it just went out, she just went out, she was sitting there, so somebody will call her. And, but uh, please uh, take a seat. And uh, Malaysia, United States, <coughs> and uh, uh, Antoinette, Lebanon. But uh, before uh, listening to them, I want uh, that uh, even Aurelie Plassé uh, uh, comes here. She is uh, the director of the World Coalition Against the Death Penalty. So she can give us a little bit of, uh, uh, of the work, what it, what it means, a uh, few minutes. But uh, what happened over this? 20 years, or what happened uh, six weeks ago, whatever you want to say. Uh, just to say that this works, I remind each of us that uh, the, at the United Nations uh, last week, we already said that 127 were the countries that voted in favor of a, of a resolution on the moratorium. I can see Asunta Cavalier there. She started to to work on that uh, when she was working for Amnesty International, then she was working like Rajiv, and now she's working with the, uh, well, uh, with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Spain. So uh, 
always on this uh, important issue. But I want to say, man, say that the countries that voted against at the United Nations now, last week, were only 38. 38 only. And uh, this is a, a big, 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 big change. And uh, Antoinette, uh, please take a seat here. And uh, so, uh, before uh, starting to listen to our special testimonies, uh, Aureli. Thank you, Mario. <clears throat> sorry, I'm, I'm late, and sorry, my throat, I have a sore throat. No, so. but you know that German <laughs> trains are not always in time. <laughs> it's not true, it was a French train. Um, I'm very happy and pleased and honored to be with you today. Uh, and the World Coalition is a big family. Uh, it started 20 years ago with the first Congress Against the Death Penalty. Um, some of you in this room were already present. Some of, some of um, the people have left us, sadly, and we will pay them a tribute on the last day. Um, and many of you are new, um, have been new over the years, um, and new again today. Um, it's been 20 years. It's been um, tough. Um, it's been very happy. Um, and we're making a difference. And I guess this is really the message I want to give you today, is that the more we work and the more we do, the less countries have the death penalty. And we are making this happen together. Um, in Africa, you know, in just a year, between October 2021 and October 2022, no less than three countries have abolished the death penalty in their laws. Um, there was also one country in Asia with Papua New Guinea. Um, there are more and more ratifications of the Second National Protocol to the ICCPR, who is putting a lock on the abolition of the death penalty. And we have more votes year by year with the UNGM moratorium resolution. Um, when the World Coalition and the World Congress started, that wasn't the case. You know, we wouldn't, I think we wouldn't dream of it. Um, but 20 years later, this is happening. It's happening at a very steady um, um, pace and it is continuing. Um, so we will hear a lot of very, very happy stories like Mongolia and the state of Maryland and hopefully Malawi very soon. Um, and we will hear this story that will inspire us to do more in more countries until we fully abolish the death penalty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Aureli, uh, uh, does not say that even if she has been working on this uh, very intensely, intensively, uh, you had the time to have two, two children? Three, 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 three. I, 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 I still am uh, the last vote at the moratorium. <laughs> now there are three. <laughs> they increased. So, uh, complimenti. I don't know how you can do that. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, because you work a lot. And, but actually, what she saw, what we saw in the World Coalition, when it started, uh, the movement, the abolitionist movement, was pretty divided. At the time of the First World Congress, uh, there were those who were speaking of abolition and those who were speaking of a moratorium on executions. And in conscience, some of those that were for abolition were thinking that those who were for, moratorium, for a moratorium were traitors. So it was really well disgusted. So the big thing has been, uh, you know that Sant'Egidio is uh, obsessed about uh, peacemaking. So it was a, a goal that we had. And then this uh, enter in the, in the crossroad of the World Congress, and, uh, but at the first World Congress, uh, Rafael, the, uh, you remember that the final document solved the problem because it put the two things as goals of the world movement. But at the beginning, the first draft, there was only one goal. So it would have been a disaster. Instead, the two rivers went together. Then grassroots, uh, civil society, 
organizations, governments, because over the la these last 20 years we have had simply one small factor. The European Union was born. An incredible factor of change in the world and uh, on human rights. And then, step by step, so governments, civil society, the different sorts of the movement going together, this has created a synergy and models of interventions that are not always just public opinion, not always just lobbying with the presidents. It is a multi-layer approach and all together. So this uh, has some results in single countries, in uh, single places, or at a worldwide level. So this is why I want to, just for a few, few minutes, give the floor to uh, Kasturi Pato. Kasturi is, you can speak from there. Kasturi is uh, from Malaysia. And she has been for many years uh, a member of the parliament and leader of an organization, and now leads another organization from civil society on human rights. Please, Kasturi. And give us give good news, because Malaysia is going to give us very good news after terrible years. Oh, yeah. um, thank you very much, uh, Mario. Um, thank you to the Italian Embassy, uh, and also to the Santa Egidio for having this uh, very important event. Just uh, Louder? Okay. Um, in almost 10 years of my campaign to abolish the death penalty in Malaysia, I, however, have not had any children in the process. <laughs> I did get married, though, this year to my husband, who is... <laughs> who, I must also say, I met at the World Congress Against the Death Penalty in Belgium. <laughs> In 2019, uh, he was the former president of ECPM. So uh, my priest was telling us that you found love and hope at an event where everyone was talking about death. Um, but uh, in the 10 years, um, coming from a country like Malaysia, uh, we had been colonized by the British from 1826 to 1957. And amongst the things that the British left was torture and the death penalty. Today the UK has abolished the death penalty and Malaysia still holds on to it. However, not all hope is lost. This year, on the 6th of October, after years and years of campaigning and lobbying, and I must also add that I'm an MP from the opposition, so it has the job to abolish the death penalty in Malaysia is 10 times harder because you have, it's important where you come from and it's important who is the person who's moving this to make this change happen. The law minister in Malaysia, Dr. Sri Wan Junaidi, tabled the first reading to abolish 11 offences that carry the mandatory death penalty in Malaysia. For, for those who don't know, Malaysia has 33 offences that have the death penalty, of which 11 are mandatory and 22 are other offences. Polluting a water source also warrants the death penalty in Malaysia. Amongst others would be treason, waging war against the king, etc. But of the 11 mandatory death uh, uh, penalty offences, 9 are from the Penal Code and 2 are from the Firearms Act. And you know, when you're talking about the penal code, it's a very emotional argument by retentionists in the country. It's always one step forward, two steps back. The minute you start speaking about social justice, the minute you start speaking about how the law is applied differently to different people. If your name has a sir or in Malaysia a title before it, then it's very unlikely that you will face the long arm of the law compared to if you are John or Sarah or Michelle or in Malaysia, Ahmad or Rama or Asong, who is a factory worker or a lorry driver or a laborer. When you have seen during the COVID how laws are applied differently on leaders who have parties in their homes, how leaders who got away with the long arm of the law when they abused COVID restrictions, what, what more the death penalty? So, in spite of all the hard work, 
I believe that the first, the tabling of the first reading in Parliament is one foot in the door. For 10 years, many of us were standing behind the door. We were banging the door. We were shouting to get our voices heard across. But now with the reading of the, the first reading, we have one foot in the door and that's important because the next would be to, for the second reading to come about in Parliament. And we hope that um, Malaysia would elect, we are currently having our election campaigns now, that Malaysia would elect good leaders to Parliament. We will have a good law minister who will take on this big, huge step that we have taken for the first reading um, so that we be successful with the second reading and it becomes um, a success. Of course, Malaysia still has the death penalty, but we have a moratorium. So there have been no executions since end of 2017 up to now. But a moratorium is just a document that is not legally binding. It's not in the constitution. It's not in the law. If tomorrow the law minister wakes up in a bad mood and says, I'm going to revoke the moratorium, then it's all hell uh, will break loose and the country is going to start uh, executing. Uh, but I also must say the disturbing news of not just over 1,300 people who are currently on death row in Malaysia, of which 75% are Malaysians and the remainder are foreigners. And the majority number of death row inmates are for uh, drug-related offences. Now, I must also mention here the Malaysian Nagendran Dharmalingam, a young Malaysian with an IQ of 69, a mentally disabled person who was executed on the 27th of April in Singapore. I remember that last year, it was just before Diwali. For those who don't know, Diwali is a festival of lights that Indians celebrate. We got this terrible news from Singapore that he was due to be executed on the eve of Diwali. And while families were preparing to celebrate the festival of lights with new clothes and food and, and merry making with family, very likely Nagendran's parents would be ordering a casket or a coffin for, to receive his body from Singapore. I met the Prime Minister and I told the Prime Minister of Malaysia to reach out to his counterpart in Singapore not to ask for a pardon, but to commute his death sentence to life. And he said he will do his best. But behind the scenes, me and fellow like-minded MPs, we drafted a letter for the opposition leader, Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim, to take up to meet, to give it to the king of Malaysia, the Agong, so the king can then reach out to his counterpart in Singapore for us to, to, to request or appeal um, that he not be executed. However, you know, you can only pull out that many rabbits from a hat. Um, after Nagendran being infected with COVID and other inmates with COVID, and there was such a lengthy process of just trying to buy time, unfortunately, he was executed on 27th of April. Um, my husband, Ellen, and I visited the family on the day of the execution, um, and the sister posed a very interesting question to us. She said, if my brother indeed carried drugs from Malaysia to Singapore, why didn't the Malaysian customs or the immigration get him? Because it would have been an entirely different story. Malaysia would not have executed him and we would have had more advocates and more platform to speak. We all know how Singapore treats uh, freedom fighters. We all know how Singapore treats lobbyists and campaigners on abolishing the death penalty apart from freedom of speech, expression, etc. It would have been much easier for Nagendran's story to be on the national agenda of the government's cabinet meeting than in Singapore. So these are the things that Malaysia, we need to work out. And the parliament, I believe, is one of the places for MPs to raise this question. But it, today, I sit here in front of you to share this little good news of the reading, of the first reading in parliament. It's not only because of what I have done, but it's because of Mario we met a few years ago. Um, was it in Berlin also, I think? Yes. Um, for um, a meeting amongst MPs uh, on the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion and Belief. And I think this is important because when you're part of the movement to abolish the death penalty, you, you see today in Iran that the death penalty is used as a political tool, you know, against freedom of speech and expression and, and, and peaceful assembly. And when you meet other like-minded campaigners of human rights and for civil liberties, you bring in the conversation of the death penalty into that. 
When you talk about abolishing child marriages, you bring the conversation of death penalty into that. You cannot talk about the death penalty or abolishing it without talking about social justice. In, in Malaysia, more than 86% of people on death row come from the minority group, marginalized, school dropouts, broken families, etc. But with that, I thank everyone who has been a part of thank the you. campaign and the movement. Thank you. Thank you, Kashturi. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. In one country, you can see almost uh, all the contradictions of the world in one country, no? Uh, but we can also win one by one. Uh, so this is very, very hopeful. Thank you. Uh, I want uh, now to go to our last, last in two intervention. And uh, uh, I'm always uh, struck by the fact that uh, there are people that I meet, we are friends with Antoinette. Uh, my first time, of, second time, I think, to meet physically Deborah. And uh, I always think, sorry, forgive me. She should not be not be existing. She should not be here uh, because they were sentenced to death in Lebanon and in Arizona for crimes that they did not commit. We are fighting so that uh, even those who committed terrible crimes can have a, a just sentence, but always respecting life. But they did not even commit their crime. I have no idea what could pass in their minds, in their heart. It's too much for me to try to, to put myself in their shoes. I, I have no idea. It is then, but... Uh, we want to, to abolish the death penalty for them and for everyone because we know that even in America, where we know from the movies about trials, justice system, fascinating the trial on movies. In, in, in. But uh, Witness to Innocence, an organization, and, uh, and the uh, Innocence Project, has demonstrated that uh, at least one out of 15 people sentenced for terrible crimes were innocent. Through the DNA, uh, revising the trials. One out of 15, but there are some that say one out of nine according to the crimes, which makes the system is broken, but not American system. Every justice system is always broken because the perfect justice does not exist. And 80% of those cases have been sentenced to death uh, according to eyewitnesses and according to confessions, or the two things combined. So we think confession, many eyewitnesses, we are certain that he she was guilty. 80% of all the cases that has been reviewed as fake cases, 80% were on the basis of eyewitnesses and confessions. It's a terrible thing in a democratic country. We can imagine what happens in an authoritarian country. That's it. So please, Antoinette, you have another one. Bonsoir. We love uh, Lebanon, eh? we love <laughs> Lebanon, and Syria, and we love all the all those countries. Excuse-moi, je suis un peu fatiguée uh, sorry. parce que je viens... She has the, the permission to speak in French. Ouais. Je viens d'arriver de, de l'aéroport, mais je suis très contente d'être parmi vous ce soir, et c'est un honneur pour moi. Euh, moi, ce soir, je suis là pour passer un message au nom de tous les prisonniers dans le monde entier, de tous les prisonniers dans le couloir de la mort. Moi, je suis, je m'appelle Antoinette Shaheen, je suis libanaise, je suis une ex-condamnée à mort. 
moi, euh, mon histoire personnelle euh, est une histoire remplie d'injustice et c'est très difficile de le résumer en quelques minutes. Mais moi, j'étais jeune, je viens d'une famille très unie, j'étais très attachée à ma mère. Moi, ils m'ont arrêtée en 1994, ils croyaient, j'étais jeune, de, ils croyaient que j'accepterais de répéter tout ce qu'ils voulaient, de signer une déclaration affirmant que mon frère Jean était au Liban au moment de l'attentat de l'église sainte Najat. Mais mon frère, il a quitté le Liban comme beaucoup d'autres, parce que mon frère, il était un membre d'un parti politique chrétien, la force libanaise, et à cette époque-là, cette parti politique a été persécuté. Et moi, je, je n'ai pas signé, mais j'ai vécu les pires de la torture. J'ai vécu la torture physique, psychologique, tout genre de torture, la soif, poulet. Et quand il voulait s'amuser, il me tenait au mur et comme s'il jouait au ballon. Ils ont brûlé mon corps. Et après, après cinq, après quatre ans, ils m'ont condamné à mort. J'ai crié que je suis innocente et malheureusement, c'est trop difficile de c'est trop difficile d'exprimer ces sentiments. C'est pour cela que je suis là ce soir pour vous dire que que la plus grande souffrance de prisonniers, c'est la solitude, c'est la solitude et l'isolement. Moi, après ce verdict, Amnesty International a publié un rapport sur mon état. Et grâce à ce rapport, j'ai commencé à recevoir des milliers de centaines de, de lettres d'Amnesty International, de la CAT aussi, qu'ils m'ont écrit partout dans le monde, partout de langue. Et après cinq ans et demi, comme je vous ai dit, c'est très difficile de résumer mon histoire, ils m'ont dit innocente dans le deuxième procès. Innocente après cinq ans et demi. Mais une grande question, qui peut me rendre la santé Qui peut effacer les traces de la torture sur mon corps c'est pour cela, après ma libération, j'avais deux, deux choix. Soit je reste dans ma maison ou je milite. Bien sûr, je choisis. Après ma libération, je, mon combat, c'est je milite. Je fais mon devoir envers les prisonniers. Et je ne veux pas, j'espère qu'une personne vit ce que je vis moi ou ma mère. Moi, j'ai rêvé pendant cinq ans et demi d'embrasser ma mère. Mais il y avait un grillage. Alors, après ma libération, je milite contre la peine de mort, contre l'injustice ou contre la torture, car tout je les ai vécus. Et comme nous sommes cette semaine à l'occasion du 8e congrès mondial contre la peine de mort, je voudrais saluer l'organisation ECPM Ensemble contre la peine de mort, que moi je, je suis participée au premier congrès, depuis le premier congrès en 2001. C'est un congrès vraiment que tous les prisonniers, tout, nous, tous on, on l'attend chaque trois ans. Raphaël, c'est... Je ne trouve pas le mot pour te dire, pour vous remercier, vraiment pour tout ce que vous faites. Pour finir, je sais que une minute, de passer ce message. Je souhaite qu'en crions tous ensemble, non à la peine de mort, mais oui, oui à, à la vie. Il faut qu'on travaille tous ensemble, tous ensemble, pour abolir la peine de mort pour abolir la torture.
partout dans le monde. Merci. Grazie. Grazie. Grazie Antoinette. E, um, permettetemi, perché dopo sarà difficile eh, di fare io dei ringraziamenti. Eh, noi ci impegniamo, noi ci impegniamo. Uh, we, we are committed to, to do together what you are asking. Okay? And, uh, but uh, let me thank again, at least now, because after I will not do it, uh, again, the Ambassador Varicchio and uh, all the people that helped this uh, event to happen. So, uh, Luigi Estero, that is the chairman tonight, and uh, uh, with Abram, Edith, Edith Abram, and uh, Fabrizio Paolilli, and uh, Eduardo Vitali, but I have many other friends I saw here from the embassy. So, and the uh, Tobias Müller and the community of Sant'Egidio here and Alexander Lincoln here in Berlin. So, uh, because I'm happy to say that uh, uh, they also, uh, Sant'Egidio is also Sint'Egidio's Gemeinschaft, uh, not just Comunità di Sant'Egidio. And now that I have done my, my thanks, uh, well, I want to give the, the word to Deborah. Milky. Debra is from Arizona, but she's German, German American. So, uh, what I know, very, what I can anticipate is that she is the second woman ever that was released from a death row in the United States after Sunny Jacobs, I think. Uh, 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 but the second woman? No. no. Perfect. I am happy to, uh, to have done a mistake. So she will say the real story. <laughs> she was... Uh, she spent 25 years, 25 years of her life in a prison and in a, on a death row. Please. Oh, okay. It's not... Uh, there's two women. But closer. Oh, Just sorry. On, uh, on, chin, on the chin. Right here. So, sort of. <laughs> uh, no, there's um, Sabrina Butler and myself and Sonny Jacobs, yes. But now there, my understanding is an, another woman was recently uh, released um, from death row. My story is um, twofold. It's personal, personal tragedy, and a legal tragedy. Um, 33 years ago, my four year old son was murdered and, by someone who I thought was a friend of mine. And uh, I just can't go into it. Uh, all, all the emotions I felt, but at some point later on in the investigation, uh, I was told that the police wanted to talk to me, and I thought that they found my son and that I was going to be reunited with him because I was told that my son was kidnapped. So the policeman that walked into the room, which I was in a room all by myself, um, and he wouldn't let any witnesses in the room. He, the first thing I asked him was if he heard anything about my son, and he ignored me as if I didn't even ask a question. <clears throat> and then he just looked at me after a few minutes and said, <clears throat> excuse me, we found your son, he was murdered, and you're under arrest. And he said that in one sentence, and I, 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 I couldn't even process what he had just told me. And I was hysterical, screaming and crying, and he was yelling at me to be quiet. And I have never, at that time I was 25 years old, 
I had never been in trouble with the law. I had never been talked to by a police officer. <clears throat> so it was very scary to be told that my son was murdered and then also that I'm being arrested for it. And he, uh, I believe he knew, he took advantage of my emotional state, my vulnerability, and he just took over and was in my face badgering me every time I was denying what he was accusing me of. He was telling me that I, I know the story, I'm here to listen to your side, and I didn't even know what he was talking about. I was so confused. And we, I didn't even know how long we were in the room at the time, but I learned later it was only 30 minutes. And I, um, I remember the ride back to Phoenix, and then I don't remember being um, put into jail. I have no memory of it. The, the first memory I have after all of this was meeting my public defender for the first time. And I asked him if this was all true. And he just gave me this confused look like I should have known. And he said, well, according to the police detective, you confessed. And he showed me five pages and I was reading it. And I, I, I said, I didn't say these things. And the first thing I asked for was, where did I sign it? I didn't sign anything and where's the tape? You know, there was no recorder in the room. <clears throat> there was not a witness in the room. There was no recording. I didn't waive my Miranda rights. I didn't sign anything. I didn't confess. So I had a trial. I thought I'd never been in court before. And, you know, what you learn in school, you think is how it, it's going to go. You hear about, you know, the... Uh, American justice system is the best in the world. That's what you hear, but it's not true. And uh, I thought, well, they'll see that I didn't do this. There's no evidence. They'll see this, my, the jury. But to my shock, I was convicted. And I thought, how can they convict me? There's no evidence. My co-defendant refused to testify against me because he said I had nothing to do with it. So, to make a long story short, uh, it, it, I uh, was convicted in 1990, sentenced to death in 1991, the very day that uh, the United States, the first Gulf War, that was the day I got sentenced. And then, um, for the next 22 years, I fought. And so I was put in a situation that I'd never been in before. I was around people I'd never been around before. I, it was sh like culture shock. My whole world just flipped in one, in one day. And I was thinking, how did I get here? Like, how am I going to get out of here? And it really comes down to making a choice. I saw around me women literally trying to kill themselves, slicing their necks, their wrists. I witnessed a woman set herself on fire, and I thought, oh my God, am I going to go crazy? And I mean, I was just trying to hang on at, you know, with, at that time, and I, I, I just made a decision. I can't, I'm not going to be like these people. I'm not going to let this place get to me. I'm innocent. I have to prove it. If I give up, I give up on my son. I don't know what happened to my son. I need to find out what happened to him. That cop's a liar. I have to prove it. And it all, oh, in the end, after I was losing appeal after appeal after, after appeal, in the end, we discovered that this cop had a long history of fabricating evidence against people. And there's a big difference between a false confession and a fabricated confession. I did not give a false confession. 
the confession was fabricated. And so that's what was used against me. That's what put me on death row. That's what the state of Arizona wanted to kill me over. And I, I did come close to an execution. I got a date. I had to go through a dry run. Um, yeah, it was, it was horrible. But I never gave up because I knew I was innocent and I was determined to, to expose this dirty detective. But the city of Phoenix and the police department already knew what kind of a cop he was. That's why they called him on his day off to come and talk to me because they knew that he, if he could write a fake confession and then <coughs> this, why they did this, I don't know. <coughs> but finally a court, it, it, unfortunately it was a court outside of the state of Arizona, but a federal court saw the big picture and they wrote the most scathing opinion against the state of Arizona. And I was, I was, um, my, everything was overturned. And after 22 years, I was set free. So. Thank you, Debbie. Yes, yes, leave us your, but we wanted to congratulate with life. Uh, yeah, well, the, the victory was bittersweet because while I was in prison, I could not deal with grieving over the loss of my son because in my mind, I, I, I always thought he was out there still, that he's still alive, he's out there. So I had to compartmentalize and I had to fight for my life, literally fight for my life. Then when I won, and I was free, everybody was elated, but the reality of my son's death after 24 years almost hit me. And so I've been out since 2013 and I've been in therapy since, and I've come a long, long way. Um, I still struggle with stuff, but I've come a long way. And one of the things that, that I, vowed that I would never do is I never wanted to uh, talk about this. I never wanted to get involved in anything. I wanted to just run and, and be away from all of it, but my conscience wouldn't let me. So I joined Witnessed Innocence. I share my story because I think it, people should be in, uh, enlightened about what really happens. It can happen to anybody. Um, and I've been part of a great organization, Witness to Innocence, and with, with the help of the European Commission and the United Nations, and without their help, we would not be able to do our work. And we've been able to get the death penalty abolished in a f few states in the, in the United States. I think, I think that Witness to Innocence is one of the big factors of change now. And... Uh, when New Mexico and uh, Connecticut, Maryland, and uh, uh, Illinois, and step by step other, other states in the United States abolish the death penalty, the mothers, victims, families for human rights, for reconciliation, and not for the death penalty. And witness to innocence movement is. Uh, is really uh, a big change. Uh, they, so I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, and, uh, and now, just allow me to, to give the word to our real chairman, uh, Luigi Estero, that has uh, some news to give us. Thank you. Just to say that, of course, we all are invited to a reception hosted by Ambassador Barricchio. So please, outside this room on the left, we will meet on the other rooms. Thank you very much to everybody for this participation. On, on the table, if you want, you can, 
on the table uh, in the corridor, there are the pictures about the birth of the death, uh, of the world coalition of, of the death penalty. So in case, with a good drink, you can go and see. <laughs>